If your circumstances are difficult, sometimes it helps to sleep on it. When you wake up, you'll feel renewed and ready to tackle life's challenges. That's exactly what the marmot does. And his biggest problem is winter. But high altitude frost is nothing an eight month nap can't fix in life, death, and taxonomy. Welcome back to Life, Death, and Taxonomy. It's your 30 minutes of interesting animal information. I'm Joe. And I'm Carlos. Thank you to Cassie for the creation of our theme song. To hear more of Cassie's music, please search Cassie Michelle on, on, Michelle on YouTube or Spotify. Michelle. Uh, and thank you to Johanna for the creation of this week's artwork. To check that out, you can visit us at our home on the web at ltdexonomy.com. And a very special thank you to Jess, to our patrons, Jesse Raspolich, Carol Raspolich, Richard Kaspar, Lottie, and Aubrey. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for helping us keep the lights on. And Lottie and Aubrey have given us some animal suggestions. So uh, for uh, for patrons out there, we love to hear your animal suggestions. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a perk. Sign up. We yeah, Also, we found out that you can't... Well, I found out because people did it you can become like a pay like a free tier patron which means you don't have to pay any money and if you want to come over and hang out and give us animal suggestions that would be fun and you and i also post the um video episodes of the podcast there yeah just come and show us that you uh that you you know you like us a little bit you know <laughs> i'm just kidding i know you like us but uh just come yeah come hang out and um part of our little community it's growing yeah all righty and today we're talking about some sleepy mountain rodents but more on that later as opposed to rocky mountain high Sl- as opposed to sleepy man banjo man oh yeah <laughs> yeah that that thing that everybody knows about i was not making reference to that but i, I was just thinking about it now uh, but yeah, what are yeah, we talking about? We're talking about the, uh, the, the, the most cowardly, uh, no. mammal in the, in the world. The yellow bellied marmot. Yeah. Yellow belly <laughs> marmot. If and that's they're not, not even really yellow bellied. They're just yellow chested. Yeah. I guess some of them can probably can be yellow bellied. And if they're just like sitting there, if and they're not go, standing up. If you go to Wikipedia, the third picture is him just sitting like a person on a rock, and it's so funny to just look. Yeah, at him. <laughs> with his feet splayed out, uh, on a rock on the on a mountain. It looks um, dumpy and majestic at the same time. <laughs> Speaking of majestic, I saw these. Um, these little in guys. California in real life, yeah. Um, up in up in, in in Yosemite, there's a I forgot the name of the lake, but there's a lake that you it's like two hours away from the entrance of Yosemite, and it's higher in elevation. And these guys were just chilling, sitting on rocks, just like that, and like looking around, just. Playing video games and watching TV, you know? (laughs) Eating Doritos. If you put a controller in this guy's hand, this one that's sitting on a rock, it would make total sense. It would make total sense. Uh, Definitely a character on regular show. Um, Yeah, but we're going to... It's also known as the Rock Chuck. Which Chuck is definitely the name I would give to this guy that's sitting on a rock. (laughs) That is Rock Chuck. That is... (laughs) <coughs> uh yeah they, uh but we're gonna call it here the burrowers uh and chuck boris because they they bore down into the ground i should have oh. done something with cowardice because they're yellow bellied but 
Uh, it was oppressed for time. Came to the uh, nicknames, and thank you to and we Diddy really for the borrowers because I did not even know what the borrowers are, which is what the really play that is. Um, and she was she was astonished, um, and said, "Just say the borrowers. Everyone will know what you mean." I was like, "Okay." <laughs> Yeah, it's a Miyazaki movie, too. Is there's it a, really? There's a movie called The Borrowers, which is like a live action with little people in it, like a Thumbelinas. Yeah. And then there's also one of the Miyazaki movies, They are the little people in it are borrowers. I forget what which one of the movie is. Which one of the... I, don't, I forget the name of it. I don't think I've... I've seen uh, quite a few of the Miyazaki movies and... I don't. I don't remember that. So it must have been like, must have been one of the slice of life ones that didn't really interest me. Um, let's. Oh, the secret world of Arietti. Yeah, I've never heard of it. Let's taxonomize this. The the marmot. Uh, the kingdom. You know it. You love it. You're in it. Animalia. Phylum. Chordata. Class. Mammalia. The order is Rodentia. It's a rodent. Uh, the family is Skiridae. Yep, Skiridae. The uh, tribe, there's a tribe for this one, is Marmotini, which is made with vodka, marmots, and <laughs> an olive, and it's shaken, not stirred. Uh, the genus is Marmota, and the species is Flavaventris. Flaversham. <laughs> I love going to brunch and uh, getting uh, endless marmotas. I do you want a marmota or a marmotini? I don't. I don't really. Lo- I don't really care for uh, gin. <laughs> I don't know what's in a martini. <laughs> I thought it was maybe gin. it is gin. I thought it was vodka. I'm pretty sure it's vodka. Yeah, it's var- it's vodka. I don't like vodka, but uh, but I think a mimosa has vodka in it. Mimosas so have champagne the, in them. Yeah, that's right. I don't know anything about. <laughs> I don't but know I, anything about these pre- breakfast cocktails. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think martini is like really alcoholic, and you would never really drink it at breakfast. <laughs> it's the idea of a martini being a breakfast cocktail. I think it's specifically a high class evening cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> just if you wake up and you have a martini, you have a drinking problem. But a mimo- mimosa is a breakfast cocktail. Yeah, if you wake up and you have a mimosa, you still have a drinking problem, but it's more socially acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I do love mimosas, just not in the morning, because uh, I love orange juice. Orange and juice you is can great. Make it sparkling. And so I would more be more likely to have a marmota than a marmotini. That's for sure. Mm. But the Probably binomial same. nomenclature for the marmot is the Marmota Flavaventris. That's fine. Yeah. So uh, since we're in the business of naming things, it's time for my favorite part of the show. Critter groups. We get to do this one again. Uh, which is the part of the show uh, where I ask you, Joe, a question. And that question is the same every time. What is the name of a group of this animal? Or what is the term of entry? Or what is the collective noun? If you saw a group of marmots, which it sounds like you did, what would you call it? Would you say that's A, an aperture of marmots, B, a burrow of marmots, C, a colony of marmots, or D, a dither of marmots? It's a colony of marmots. Whenever uh, it's are, a, I, I saw it on the... Uh, you already I thought knew. I was hoping that there was like... That the Wikipedia page just was calling it a colony. And that there was actually another one. But... Yeah, a lot of... There's a lot of colonies of things. It's yeah, like when schools. it's... I, I, I saw it was very uh, prominently displayed. And I was like, ah, maybe he, he's going to see it. So when that happens, I probably should just default to... It's another reason why nitty gritty nomenclature is uh, is quickly overtaking critter groups as the more practical of the two games. Um, and it makes a uh, like it's it's interesting to it, you learn something, not just something that's they made up on Reddit. You know, oh, it's just so much harder because uh, <laughs> not because uh, it's rare that I just like 
oh, translate Flav Aventris or something, and it's like, oh, it just means this. I have to be like, translate Flav, okay? And now, now there's a transition there, and then Entris. How, how, what does that mean? What does that suffix mean? Okay, it means this. Like, I have to put it together. Mm. Like I'm Indiana Jones. And it's not even that you can just, like, get to know one language, because it's multiple languages that they use. Yeah, and then it's, uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's definitely more scalable <laughs> than critter <laughs> groups. Um, but yeah, a colony of marmots is what you would call uh, a group of them. So, that out of the way, would you like to hear about what it looks like? I sure would, even though I've seen it in real life. I know. So this is for the benefit of the listener. It is a large, fat squirrel. <laughs> End of discussion. Um, really, that's... I mean, that that is... You are... If you are imagining a large, fat squirrel, you are 95% of the way there. Um, Take some it bushiness has, out of the tail, and you're good. yeah. It has it has brown and tan fur, with, and the yellow-bellied marmot in particular has not yellow, but blonde, like yeah, blonde, golden uh, fur on its chest and then on the front of its legs. Um, it is like a mid-stage Pokemon evolution between a squirrel and a beaver. Like <laughs> you would catch a squirrel on Route One. Um, and then by the time you got to the third gym, you would have a beaver. But in between, you'd have the awkward marmot stage. Um, it has a shorter and less fluffy tail than a, than like a squirrel. Um, or it just... I think it is. it does belong to the same... Um, uh, Ground squirrel uh, family? F yeah, family is squirrels. Uh, yeah. Skiridae. Skiridae, yeah. But... Um, yeah, so squirrels have that big fluffy tail that arches ba over their back, and uh, this is not the case. It's 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 like you took all the life out of that, uh, and it's just this kind of wet sock on, attached to its its hindquarters, and that's uh, you have the tail of a marmot. Um, and there isn't that much uh, else to say. If you if you're imagining a, a large fat squirrel with a wet sock attached to its rear, then you have a marmot in your head. <laughs> you should see a doctor <laughs> to have that removed. Um, but I did say it was large. How large is it, Joe? It's a great question. Welcome to the beloved Measure Up segment, the official listener's favorite part of the show. The part of the show when, when we present the animal size and dimensions in relatable terms through a quiz that's fun for the whole family. It's also a part of the show that's introduced by you when you send an audio of yourself saying, saying you're tittering the words measure up into ldtaxonomy at gmail.com. We don't have a new measure up intro this week. So we're going to get to hear from a marmot. So the um, if you've seen the screaming marmot meme yeah. where you see a marmot or like you see something, I think people were calling it like the screaming gopher meme, but it is a marmot uh, that like stands up and like and there's a mountain vista behind it and then it just yells like a man that's the <laughs> meme uh this is what that video sounds like the real marmot sound what it, oh i haven't seen i think i i've definitely heard the real like screech of the marmot but I haven't see, I haven't seen whatever videos where it screams like a oh, man. Yeah, you'll have to look that up because I could play it, but then it's just gonna sound like a man screaming. You have to see it with a visual. <laughs> um, without further ado, the listener's favorite part of the show. <laughs> it sounds like a really like. I absolutely had to take my headphones out for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 pierced my core. I, <laughs> I hope I hope everybody else strength. is okay. I can adjust. See, I can't adjust in real time. I don't know what it's going to sound like to you, but I can protect the listener. Yeah, that was unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before we start getting into measure up the 
like a couple weeks ago, we heard from Calvin. We played a video of him specifically saying what you what you said might be the fee, might be the the sentiment of the listener, which is that measuring guns is getting old. Let's do something <laughs> else. And I think he's gonna really like this measure up, and you'll see why soon. All right. All right. Let's talk about length. They're 47 to 68 centimeters, which is 18 and a half to 27 inches. How many ultra whistle diameters go into the length of a marmot? I think you're going to have to go ahead and tell me what an ultra whistle is. Okay, here's a hint. The ultra whistle was a steam whistle, like the kind used on trains and steamships. And like uh, apparently, like standalone steam whistles would be on, um, like in factories and like uh, quarries. You know, like if you wanted to make a really loud sound for everyone around to hear, you need a steam whistle. Um, and it was said to be as loud as 124 decibels if you were standing a hundred feet away. So that could really <laughs> damage your hearing. If yeah. you're right next to it. There's a there's a really, really, really terrible and silly anime called Bo 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 from like uh, the early two thousands. Um the main character's main attack is called Super Fist of the Nose Hair, but I'm pretty sure if he had a second attack it would be Ultra Whistle. <laughs> I wonder if an ultra whistle sounds like a marmot screen. I was I did this one because I wasn't I didn't. I was thinking about like, how do they make whistle sounds back then? Well, like nowadays, you honk a car horn and it's like a recording of a horn. Is it? But then, like, I'm pretty sure it's not a real horn anymore. Um, but then I, I for some reason, it never occurred to me that steam whistles was literally like the steam engine on a train and the steam running the steam through the whistle. To make the whistle sound. Guess I should have thought of that. But uh, but it works because Calvin likes trains. Oh, and my son likes trains. And so I get to watch trains go by for uh, hours on end. You, When you're a little boy, you either like dinosaurs or trains or both. Well, I kind of graduated over into... Cars. Uh, it's actually starting to like animals now. Every night we go. There's a there's an uh, an alphabet alphabetically ordered um, se- you know series of pictures of animals, and he's enjoying naming them all. Except for the, we get to Q, and it's like, oh look, this is a quokka and a quail and a quetzal, and it's like, uh, okay, daddy doesn't even know these ones, um, <laughs> but um. Also, by the way, uh, a car horn is made uh, using an elect uh, is made electrically um, by using a thin metal disc and an electromagnet. Uh, what? And as the electromagnet oh, not- gets energized, it exerts force on the metal disc, and that somehow creates the sound of the car horn. I am not I was, intelligent I enough to explain that thought. any further. Uh, but it is not a recording of. But it's also not a sound. horn. But it is also not moving I thought air it was, through us through a space. I thought it was that old cars have, like the a big bicycle horn on it. You know, like the kind that you honk the no, horn old, literally. Old cars have uh, an an old man inside each one that says "auga" whenever you push the button. Oh, that's right. So, that's true. <laughs> so I just assume, like, all right, this is going to be a callback. They're just going to like record that and put it in the car. I did not think it was m- magnets and discs. Very interesting. Horns in on vehicles are more interesting than you think. Well, you just but never how, think about it. But I would very much like to replace my car horn with a Uga, a Uga now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So how, how how many the diameter you're looking for? Diameter of an whistle. ultra whistle. Um, I 
How many marmots go into it? How many ultra whistles go into a marmot? Ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say two, and leave it at that. Final answer. Yep. The correct answer is one point three. Almost just one. Ah, uh, that is not a nurse. The ultra to whistle it. was twenty inches in diameter. That is an ultra whistle. It's more yeah. ultra than most whistles I've seen, at least. <laughs> Ken, is there a recording of an ultra whistle? Don't play it because my ears can't take another another hit. My eardrums have been whistled at <laughs> by the marmot. So, nope. Uh, YouTube has no idea what I want. It's trying to show me train crashes. So, in incorrect. Google was not looking for uh, train crash. Sadness. I was looking for something interesting. Let's talk about weight. They're between one point six and five point two kilograms, or three pounds eight ounces. Uh. To 11 pounds, 7 ounces. We go, it runs the gamut of baby weights. Yeah. Both um, are both pretty unhealthy. Concerning to, <laughs> c- concerning to concerning for different C- reasons. Concerning to <laughs> devastating. How, how about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, forgot, yeah, I forgot I haven't asked the question yet. How many marmots could the Union Pacific Big Boy 4014 pull? It's a train train heavy one. Yeah. Big boy. Um probably a lot. An engine, I imagine that's what it is. Mm-hmm. It's here's a hint. The big boy was a type of steam locomotive manufactured by the Union Pacific between nineteen 19- 1941 to 1944. They were used all the way up until 1962. Considering that trains can be like several miles long and all full of all the cars full of stuff and all pulled by one engine. Um, it's going to well, it's a lot. Th- I think the miles long one are those are more modern. But the, but I guess yeah. Um, Up to the '60s, though. I'm, sh- yeah. I th- I'm pretty sure they can have mile long trains in the '60s. So what you're really looking for, I guess, it's inaccurate to say how many marmots. You're looking for the locomotive tractive weight. So tractive force, which is like pushing and pulling force. So I don't know if like. Because I don't know if it means like you can't it can't necessarily pull dead weight a a million marmots. You know, it has to be on wheels. Oh, I see what you're saying. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what if there's like butter underneath it? Because then then it can pull a lot more. A hot buttered marmot. Yeah. uh, What if it what if it was a million hot buttered marmots? Would you think you could pull that one? (laughs) Why does it have to be hot? I you I mean it has to be hot. Butter doesn't coagulate. So you could drop it in your marmotini. (laughs) Um (coughs) the butter. Um I'm kind of hungry now. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I, I don't know. I'm going to say 100,000 pounds. So 9,000 marmots. 9,000 hot buttered marmots can be hooked up to the back of to this this engine and pulled up and down the Union Pacific Railroad. <laughs> Final answer? Yeah. The correct answer is 11,836 marmots. Huh. Union Pacific Big Boy 414 is the most powerful steam locomotive with a tractive force of 135,000 pounds. What eleven thousand? What? Eight hundred and thirty-six. Uh, 
<laughs> to, seventy six. Oof. If it would have to repeat it, this course. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna take this I already have the I just want the credits. <laughs> it it surprised me that and I guess it shouldn't have because all the like uh old cartoons had steam locomotives in it. But they went all the way to the sixties. Like the same year we went to the moon we were using steam po- powered trains. I mean it just takes a long time to phase that kind of stuff out, especially if it's working fine. But like, especially if it can pull one hundred and thirty-five thousand pounds. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there were more diesel trains than steam trains, probably around that time. But um, because it makes more sense. But they still use steam trains today. It's just kind of more of a novelty. Yeah, because they look cool and sound cool. They certainly do. Uh, but that's all I got for that. Do you have any fast facts before we get into the major fact? I sure do. The mar the yellow bellied marmot lives in the western U.S. and southwestern Canada, which is why you saw it because you were in the western U.S. and in the although Yosemite. If if you're in if you're looking at the Wikipedia map, it looks like it's not in Yosemite. Yeah, it looks like I, it really does not like California, except for like what what is that San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> It just di- it just dips right through into San Francisco and doesn't touch the rest of the state, um, but it does live all over that that region. Um, it likes uh, to be pretty high above sea level. It can be found as uh, much as fourteen thousand feet uh, above sea level. Um, they like valleys, meadows, foothills. Um, not heavily wooded areas in particular. Um, they like to eat grass, grains, leaves, flowers, eggs, insects. They are omnivorous. Um, and they live for f- about 15 years in the wild. They become sexually mature at uh, two years, after which they have their mar mitzvah, and then they can go off and <laughs> sow their wild oats. Pretty good. I like mar mitzvah. <laughs> that's another. That's another one. I I I can't take credit for. If you did that one, um, the uh, they spend about eighty percent of their time in their burrows, which so it's kind of remarkable that you saw one at all. Uh, they live in in colonies of about twenty individuals, so they're gregarious, relatively. Um, And they got to keep an eye out for foxes, dogs, coyotes, wolves, and eagles. Typical North American uh, predators. Um, And if they do spot danger, they whistle to each other. You know, uh, uh, ultra whistle, apparently, because my ears are still ringing (laughs) from what you just played to me. Um, But, yeah, I'll leave it at that and uh, let you take over the major fact. Well... Uh, I'm calling this major fact brilliant burrows. Marmots live in places that are cold and even frozen for long periods. Uh, so they spend most of their life sleeping through it. Uh, when I saw it, I saw it in the s- early summer. And we the, the, the place we went to was at such an elevation that it was still, there was a chill in the air. Um, but they were out and about. They were, they were, they were none the wiser to them. It was, it was a hot summer, hot marmot. So them, for them, it was a Tuesday. Yeah. They bro- uh, got out the hot, hot butter. Um, <laughs> marmots spend 80% of their lives asleep and 60% of that is in hibernation. Not 60% of their lives, not 60% of the 80%. Um, to sleep that much, you have to have an excellent bedroom, and they do. Marmots live in daily use burrows that can be three feet deep and up to 50 feet long. Wow. Um, during the winter, their hibernation burrows can be as deep as 23 feet or seven meters. Uh, you got to get real. You're, you're, you're digging your way down the mountain, essentially. Gotta stay warm. Just kidding. 
Uh, in the spring and summer, they are most active during the day, but they take siestas at noon to avoid the heat of the day. So even when they're active, they're sleeping for a good portion of their 24-hour period. Um, oh, I am, and if you, I am so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to visit one today, you'll have to come back later. They start to hibernate around September, and they sleep all the way to May. It's very jealous. A, like, what even is spring at that point? <laughs> it's summer. Sp- spring is late May, and that's then it's summer. Um, so, why, why, why do they got? Why do the males got to get good so good at uh, burrowing? Um, because it's, it's their, it's how they woo the ladies. Two year old males, uh, that emerge from their burrows in the spring immediately start digging their own burrows to prepare for mating season. A great burrow can earn the male marmot many maidens. Mm. Uh, they mate with two or three females each year. When the pups reach a year old, the male will vacate the family burrow, but he's not a deadbeat. He's sticking around the area to defend one or two of the females and their pups. He can't defend all three or four. So he picks his he's favorites. He's got to pick the ones he likes the he most. He picks his favorites like like <laughs> Jacob in the Bible. It's like, ah, yeah, I, don't, pretty much. I don't like Rachel. <laughs> they call this style of mating... Uh, what do they call Chauvinism? it? Chauvinism? <laughs> no, it's something like that, though. <laughs> um, harem polygamous mating system. Mm, that's got political correctness written all over it. I love it. I think it's because harem describes that it's male. The male is the one that... Uh, no, polygamy describes one male and several females, where like polygamy describes one female That's and several right. males. True, true, true. Um, but the, I guess there's some some that do the opposite, which I don't know how. Uh, because males are generally, in, in mammals are generally, um, what should we say, uh, expendable. <laughs> they're more expendable than females because you one male can reproduce with three ma- females in a season but if uh but one female can only reproduce with w- once you know so you got to have the females let the males guard the burrow and get taken by the eagles uh because we we got to have them females in the burrows protected. Right. So I guess I don't understand the other way around in nature. Uh, some, some females can, uh, can they have like interesting reproductive systems that allow them to, yeah. I say this tastefully collect genetic material from various partners and, uh, choose which one, uh, actually, ends up doing the fertilization true uh if you want to learn more about that i think we talk about that in the hyena episode there's very interesting dynamics there but that's all i got 23 foot deep burrows of of just just absolutely chock full of hot buttered marmots (laughs) <laughs> exactly yum yum uh <laughs> also 80 uh, percent asleep how long do how much of the human life is a, is spent asleep like a third right like 30 30 something percent i guess yeah because it's like a third of the day yeah. Right now, that's yeah, not the case for third. me, but um, <laughs> it's supposed to be a third. 
uh, yeah, imagine. I mean, what? it's not eighty. It's not eighty percent of the day, right? It's eighty percent of their their lives or like the year. Because they sleep, they hibernate from September to to May, so it's just one giant nap. But it's not like a koala where it's like it's, it's where when it's active. No, you said it. What is sixty percent when it's active? It's still, or it t it takes no, siestas. Sixty percent is in hibernation. It takes siestas while it's uh even even during yes. uh when it's not hibernating. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a Midday. like a like a lion that sleeps like twenty out yeah. of twenty four hours a day. No, it's more because the winters are so long up in the mountains. Yeah, you know, live somewhere else, or you know, live where you are and sleep a lot. I'm down with that. Uh huh. Uh, any anything that involves sleeping more just just sounds really really, really nice. <laughs> Um, Alright, yeah, that's the yellow belly marmot. Uh, so for you out there in Podcastia, whistle if you hear danger. Sleep as much as you can. And dig a tunnel, dig, dig a tunnel. Like the <laughs> marmot here in life, death, and taxonomy. Hey Taxonomy Titans, I just want to remind you that we now have a Patreon. Patrons can see full video episodes and get shoutouts on the show. But ultimately, it's a way for you to help us cover some costs and get even better. Still, reviews are the best way to help us grow. So if you haven't left one yet, we'd really love to hear from you. As always, thanks for listening and engaging. podcast <laughs> quick before the wolves come um.